We are going to look at the life of Jetha, judge, commander, man of faith. Who was he? What did he do? He was the ninth judge of the Israelites around 1256 to 1250 BC. He belonged to the half tribe of Manasseh that was on the east side of the Jordan River. He freed Israel from the Ammonite opposition. He suffered a personal tragedy of his own making in the process. Let's look into this in depth, but let us be clear. The scripture really does not answer an important question. It gives us some strong hints, but not real clear. Let us use some common sense and biblical principles to see what does the scripture really say. What led up to this war? Let's look at Judges 10 verse 7. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. The Israel began to worship the gods of the Amorites and began to serve them while subdued by the Amorites east of the Jordan. Judges 10 verse 8 From that year they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years, all the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. Judges 10 15 And the children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. Because of God's promise to Abraham and his great mercy, he heard their repentance. Israel realized they had to stop putting their children as a sacrifice to the false god, Moloch, by burning up the children in the fire. Judges 10, verse 16. So they put away the foreign gods from among them, and serve the Lord, and his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Israel destroyed their foreign gods and worship only the Lord. The Lord had compassion for the people. Judges 10, verse 17. Then the people of Ammon gathered together in a camp at Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled together and encamped in Mizpah. The armies of Ammon were mobilized in Gilead at that time, preparing to attack Israel army at Memphis, preparing to go to war. You can see that from the map that was included there. You can see where they was located. Judges 10, verse 18. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin the fight against the people of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. They needed someone to lead them in battle, and he will be our commander and judge on the east side of the Jordan. Judges 11 verse 1 Jetha the Gileite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. No additional information about his mother or father. We do not even know if his mother or father was even alive at that time. Judges 11 verse 2 Gilead wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. His wife's second marriage, sons from the first marriage. It was all about inheritance. Judges 11 verse 3 So Jephthah escaped from his brothers and lived in the territory of Tob where worthless men gathered themselves around him and went out on raiding parties with him. If you look at the map there, you can see where Tob is. It's way far north. He gathered himself a small army. Judges 11, verse 4. It was about this time that the Amorites began their war against Israel. Tob was 80 miles to the north, near Syria. He led a band of adventurers a reckless person, brigands, the Robin Hood of the area. He was known as a man of valor and had no trouble gathering a faith following a small army. Judges 11, verse 5. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war against Israel that the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. The elders decided to send themselves 80 miles to solicit his help to lead the war against the Ammonite. Judges 11 verse 6 Then they said to Jetha, Come and be our commander, that we may fight against the people of Ammon. 
A commander is a military term, but also used as a ruler or king. Judges 11, verse 7. So Jetha said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? This indicates that Jetha's removal was a tribal matter, not just among his father's family. Judges 11, verse 8. So the elders of Gilead told Jetha, Well, we're coming back to you now, so you can accompany us, fight the Ammonites, and become the head of all inhabitants of Gilead. They are offering to make him king of Gilead. Judges 11, verse 9. Then Jethro asked the elders of Gilead, If you all send me to fight against the Amorites, and the Lord hands them over right in front of me, will I really become your head? He just asked them, Do you really expect me to believe that? Judges 11, verse 10. The elders of Gilead responded to Jethro. May the Lord serve as a witness that we're making this agreement between ourselves to do as we said. They just said, we swear to it. They replied, we promise with a solemn oath. Judges 11, verse 11. So Jetha went with the elders of Gideon, and the people appointed him head and military commander over them. Jetha uttered everything he had to say with the solemnity of the oath of the Lord's present in Memphis. We notice Jetha's emphasis that it would be the Lord's victory, not his. It was before the Lord that agreement was witnessed and before the General Assembly at Memphis. Judges 11, verse 12. Afterwards, Jetha sent messengers to the king of the Amorites to ask him, What is your dispute between us that prompt you to come and attack my land? Interesting question. Judges 11, verse 13. The king of the Amorites answered the messenger of Jetha, We're here because Israel took away my land from the Arman River as far as Jabbok River and as far as the Jordan River when they came up from Egypt. So restore it as a gesture of goodwill. Take a look at the map. And you can see the area that they're talking about that they want restored. Judges 11, verse 14. But Jethro sent additional messengers again to the king of the Amorites. Verse 15. And they informed him. This is Jethro's response. Israel didn't seize the land of Moab, nor the land of the Amorites. Judges 11, verse 16 through 26. Jephthah explains what happened between the Israelites and the Amorites when Israel was heading to the Promised Land. There was a major battle, and Israel took control over the entire land of the Amorites that lasted for over 300 years. But you did not retake the land during that time. Judges 11, verse 16 through 17. But when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and on to Kadesh. When Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Give us permission to go through your country. But the king of Edom would not listen. They sent also to the king of Moab, and he refused. So Israel stayed at Kadesh. Judges 11, 18 through 19. Next, they traveled through the wilderness, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab, and camped on the other side of the Ammon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for Aaron was its border. Then Israel sent messengers to child king of the Amorites, who ruled Hesbon, and said to him, Let us pass through your country to our own place. Judges 11, verse 20-21 20 Shihon, however, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his troops and encamped at Jarth, and fought with Israel. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and his whole army into the Israel hands, and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of Amorites who lived in that country. Judges 11, 22-24 Capturing all of it from Arnon to the Jabal and from the desert to the Jordan. Now, since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your God, Shamash, gives you? 
Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. Judges 11, 25-26 Are you any better than Brock, son of Zephor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For three hundred years Israel occupied Heshbon, Aror, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Aranon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? There's a map just showing you that line again. The Apostle Paul said Jetha was a man of faith, and he was listed in the faith chapter. Hebrews 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, and Jephthah, and also of David and Samuel and the prophets. We know from the scripture that Jephthah was not a hothead looking for a fight. He recognized the real cost of war, and he knew his scriptures. He makes an attempt at an honorable peace by showing that there is no just cause for the quarrel. This was required by law to avoid war until negotiations have failed. Why is this? Deuteronomy 20, verse 10 through 12. When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim and offer a peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but war against you, then you shall besiege it. Deuteronomy 20, verse 13 and 14. And when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and all that is in the city, all its spoils, you shall plunder for yourself, and shall eat the enemy's plunder which the Lord your God gives you. Judges 11, verse 27. Therefore I have not sinned against you, but you wronged me by fighting against me. May the Lord, the judge, render judgment this day between the children of Israel and the people of Ammon. Judges 11, 28. But the king of the Amorites wouldn't heed the message that Jethro had sent to him. Let's look at Jephthah for arguments. Number one was the facts of history, verses 14 through 22. The land grant from the Lord, verses 23 through 24. Three centuries of occupation, verses 25 through 26. And they were fighting against God, verses 27 and 28. Finally, he hadn't declared war on Ammon. It was Ammon that declared war on Israel and against God. Judges 11, verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Memphis of Gilead. And from Memphis of Gilead, he advanced towards the people of Ammon. We can see that from the little map that we have of the land. Now, what have we learned so far? Number one, empowered by the Spirit of God, Jephthah called for volunteers and mustered his army. Memphis was the capital his base of operation. Two, we have learned so far the circumstances of birth or of family are not a handicap to the person who will live by faith. Jephthah was installed as captain and leader. After an attempt at negotiation, he attacked and silently defeated the Amorites. However, the excitement of winning caused him to offer his fame ill-considered vow. The picture is a is the battle that Jephthah had against the Amorites. Judges 11, verse 30. Jephthah made this solemn vow to the Lord, If you truly give the Amorites into my control. Judges 11, 31. Then, if I return from the Amorites without incident, whatever comes out the doors of my house to meet me will become the Lord's, and or... I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Judges 11.32 Then Jetha crossed over to the Amorites and attacked them, and the Lord gave them into his control. So what has happened so far? The Lord gave him victory over the Amorites. He captured 20 other strongholds as he pursued the fleeing enemy army. 
This will guarantee freedom and safety for Israel as they traveled in the territory of Gilead. The Amorites didn't threaten Israel for another 50 years. Judges 11, verse 33. And he defeated them from Aaron as far as Myth, twenty cities, and to Abel Kerman with a great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. God fulfilled Jesus' request and gave the Ammonites into their hands. Aram is 14 miles east of the Dead Sea, near the intersection of the Aranon River and the southern boundary of Reuben and the King's Highway on the main north-south trade route. Israel won the war, and there was a great celebration because the Lord gave them victory over the Amorites. This is a picture shown of the celebration. Judges 11.34 When Jephthah came to his house at Memphis, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with tambourines and dancing. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. We have to remember... Children were the retirement for old parents during this time period. Judges 11.35 And it came to pass, when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. Judges 11.36 So she said to him, Father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the people of Ammon. Judges 11.37 Then she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone for two months, that I may go and wander on the mountains, and be well my virginity, my friends and I. Nowhere in the text does it indicate that Jephthah actually killed his daughter. Nor do we find anyone bewailing her death. The emphasis is on remaining a virgin. Judges 11.38 So he said, Go. He sent her away for two months, and she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mount. Notice she bewailed her virginity. Let's look at a few questions. If Jethro was going to kill his daughter, he would want her to be home with himself, not running around on the mountains with her girlfriends. Why would the girl lament her virginity if she was expected to die? Of what significance is virginity if you're heading for the grave? She would have been lamenting her impending death instead. Judges 11, verse 39. And it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father, and he carried out his vow with her which he had vowed. She knew no man, and it became a custom or ordinance in Israel. Judges 11, verse 40, that the daughter of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jethro the Gilead. Personally, I think she deserves to stand with Isaac as a faithful child, willing to obey both Father and God, no matter what the cost. Judges 12, verses 1 through 6, covers his conflict with Ephraim. Judges 12, verses 1. A little while later, the army of Ephraim was mustered, and they crossed to Zippon, and they confronted Jephthah and asked, Why did you cross over to fight the Amorites without calling us to accompany you? We're going to burn your houses down around you. The leader of the tribe of Ephraim expressed to Jephthah the same pride and anger they had shown to Gideon. As before, they felt entitled to share the glory of victory, even though they weren't willing to risk their lives in battle. They had only hostility to the new ruler of the tribes east of the Jordan. Judges 12, verse 2. But Jephthah replied to them, my army and I were engaged in a serious fight with the Amorites. I called for you, but you didn't deliver me from their control. Verse 3, When I saw that you wouldn't be delivering me, I took my own life in my hands, crossed over to fight the Amorites, and the Lord gave them into my control. So why have you come here today to fight me? It looks like he asked for help in Ephraim, and they just totally refused to help. Judges 12, verse 4. 
Then Jephthah mustered all the men of Gilead, fought the tribe of Ephraim, and defeated them, because they had been claiming, You descendants of Gilead are fugitives in the midst of the tribes of Ephraim and Asa. Judges 12, verse 5. The descendants of Gilead seized control of the Jordan River's fords along the border of Ephraim's territory. Later on, when any fugitive from Ephraim asked them, Let me cross over, the men from Gilead would ask him, Are you an Ephraimite? If he said no, Judges 12, verse 6, they would order him, pronounce the word Sibylla right now. If he said Sibylla, not being able to pronounce it correctly, they would seize him and slaughter him there at the fords of the Jordan River. During those days, 42,000 descendants of Ephraim died that way. Judges 12, verse 7. Jephthah governed Israel for six years. Then Jephthah died and was buried somewhere in the cities of Gilead. His tragic vow. Let's look at it closer with the, as a review. Judges 11, 30-31. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's and or I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Jephthah made a vow if God would give the Israelites victory over Amorites, Jephthah would sacrifice to the Lord whatever came out of his house when he arrives at home in Memphis. Let's look at a few things. God gave him victory and Jephthah kept his promise. But what was his promise? And how did he keep it? What actually happened to Jephthah's daughter, his only child? The more we study Jephthah's vow, the more puzzling it becomes. Ask me just a few questions. How did he know who or what would come out of the door of his house? What if the first thing to greet him happened to be an unclean animal that is unacceptable to God? What if that person turned out to be a neighbor's child or a visiting stranger? What right did Jessup have to take either life and thereby offer to God a sacrifice that cost him nothing? Because all sacrifices has to cost a person something. He knew that God didn't approve of or accept human sacrifices. The Amorites worship put their children through the fire of Moloch. Where would he offer his daughter as a sacrifice? The Lord only acceptable sacrifices at the tabernacle altar during this time. Sacrifices had to be offered by the Levitical priests. He would have to travel to Shiloh to fulfill this vow. It is doubtful that a priest would offer a human being as a sacrifice on the altar. Shiloh lies in the territory of Ephraim, who had a deadly feud with him. Would a spirit and empowered man committed to the Lord even make such a vow? We know it is acceptable to God to make vows provided they obey the laws governing them. Vows were completely voluntary, but the Lord expected the vow to be fulfilled. Volumes have been written on the subject of Jesus' rash vow, the question being whether in doing to his daughter according to his vow. Did he really did offer her in sacrifice, or whether she was to remain a virgin and dedicated to God? Remember, Samuel also was dedicated to God. 1 Samuel 1, verse 11. Hannah made a vow. Lord of the heavenly armies, if you just look at the misery of your maidservant, remember me. Don't forget your maidservant. If you give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and a razor will never touch his head. The majority of the writers thought she died. Nowhere in the text does it indicate that he actually killed his daughter or sacrificed her. Nor do we find anyone crying about her death. The emphasis has always been on remaining a virgin. What did God say that could be done about a vow? Is this what Jephthah did? Leviticus 27, verse 1 through 34, 
covers the laws of our vows. Is this why Hannah was able to dedicate to God Samuel for his service? Leviticus 27 verse 28. However, anything utterly devoted to the Lord, people, animals, or inheritance fields should not be sold or redeemed, for they are most holy to the Lord. Interesting, this is the only vow to God that cannot be redeemed that I know of. Once a vow is devoted to God, we are required to keep it, cannot get out of it in any way. I personally do not believe Jethro's daughter was killed or sacrificed. The scriptures, he did know the scriptures, tells him what he could do and how to handle the vow. She was dedicated to God just as Samuel was. She served out her life serving in the tabernacle. She did not bewail her death, but she bewailed her virginity. Two different parts with connective or or and between the two parts in a sentence. When we look at many different translations, they all seem to have the word and except for one, and they use the word or. Judges 1131, Young Literal Translation. Then it had been that which at all comes out from the door of my house to meet me in my turning back in peace from the Ben and Ammon. It's been between Jehovah or I have offered it up, a burnt offering. The use of this particle, which many interpreters suggest, introduces the important alternative. That if a person, the dedication, would be made to the service of the sanctuary, if a proper animal, clean, or thing, it would be offered on the altar. Several authorities point out that the little word, or, or and, says, in Hebrew is a single letter W, or wall, W-A-W. This connective, which can either be translated and, or, or. This implies that whatever meant him when he returned home would be dedicated to the Lord, if a person or sanctified to the Lord, if an animal. If he was meant by his daughter, Jetha would give his daughter to the Lord to serve God at the tabernacle, same as Samuel was done. Let's look at two examples of women serving in the tabernacle. Exodus 38, 8. He made the lever of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving woman who assembled at the door of the tabernacle meeting. Another one was 1 Samuel 2, verse 22. Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel, and how they laid with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle meeting. She would remain a virgin, which meant that she would not know the joys of motherhood, or continue her father's inheritance in Israel. This would be a reason enough for her and her friends to spend two months grieving or her virginity. After using some common sense, biblical principles, and knowing what the Lord wants, likes and dislikes, and his righteous characteristics, we can see what the scriptures really say. I cannot really see his daughter as a sacrifice, but dedicated to the work of the Lord as a temple servant.